And so I, I have a very specific earliest memory of prayer uh, in my head. I don't, it's not a memory of like the first time I prayed. It's just the earliest memory I, I have of praying. I was probably five or six, and I did the classic little kid under the window at nighttime. Blinds are open. It's dark. I, in my brain, probably thought it was like midnight. I was staying up late talking to God. It was probably like 8.30. Uh, but I prayed for two specific things uh, that I can remember. I think I prayed long or something. I don't know, I was five. It's probably not as dramatic as it is in my memory. But the first thing I prayed for was anyone in my five-year-old brain whose name I could think of, I prayed for by name. And I think I just asked like God would protect them, have his hand over them, probably not in those same words because five-year-olds don't know those Christianese terms. But I asked for God like to specifically protect everyone I could think of by name. But the second thing I prayed for, the way I concluded my prayer, was what was really important to me about this prayer, uh, and it still is very important. I, I prayed, and I said, God, when I grow up, I want to be the real Tarzan. <laughs> because as a kid, like especially as a young boy, like Tarzan is living the dream. Dude runs around the jungle, hanging out with monkeys in his underwear, and like that's every five-year-old boy's dream. But here's the thing. Uh, something you should know about me is I'm a distance runner. I run cross country and track for Hillsdale. And I, if you know anything about distance runners, uh, we're not the biggest fans of dressing very modestly when we run. Uh, if you see guys run around the woodlands, uh, cross country teams are kind of known for like wearing their short shorts and guys should never wear short shorts unless they're running for eight miles. Like, it gets hot, y'all. I know you don't want to see it. I thought about bringing a picture and be like, see, I look like Tarzan, but y'all don't want to see that. But I think that my prayer came true. I think like run around the woodlands, I really feel like Tarzan running around in my short shorts, running through the woods, hanging out with monkeys because my friends act like monkeys when we run. So I, I think I'm the real Tarzan. That prayer was answered with yes, but that's what I'm talking about this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about prayer. Daniel got us kicked off on this new sermon series, The Good Fight, walking through the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, and I'm just bringing us into 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And I'm going to talk to us about prayer. So listen to the word of the Lord. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. So I know that talking about prayer can really for most people, it's usually on either end of a spectrum. It's either something that you're like, you're super gung-ho about talking about, like you love talking about prayer. It's your favorite thing. Or you're kind of on the other end where it's like, I don't love talking about this. I don't have a great prayer life. And let's just, can we move on? And I want y'all to know that like, I'm going to address both ends of that spectrum. Hopefully what I'm going to talk about is addressing you on either end and everywhere in between that. Like prayer is something that everybody needs. We know it's something that is super important. And this summer for me, working with the pastors, learning a lot through this internship has been just a lot about asking questions. And in preparing for this message, like I couldn't kick these four questions out of my mind. And I just realized like God was telling me like, it's okay to ask questions on stage. Like I don't got it all figured out, y'all. Like I'm 20 years old. The first time I preached at Loft, uh, when I was 15, Daniel talked about, um, it was the first time I ever had the opportunity to do something like this. Uh, I made the comment, unironically, not as a joke. I said, like, I don't know why y'all want to listen to a 15-year-old. Like, y'all are the ones that are supposed to have it all figured out. And then everyone laughed when I said that. And as a 15-year-old, I was like, that wasn't supposed to be a joke. Uh, now I know y'all don't have anything figured out. Um, I've learned that in the five years at least, but this summer has been about figuring things out for me. And these are the questions I had about prayer. Uh, the first is this, what is prayer? Uh, in my 14 years of being in school, I've started to learn uh, eventually that defining your terms is pretty good. So if you're gonna talk about prayer, you gotta define it. What is prayer? Once we figure out what it is, why do we need to do it? Why is it worth our time? Why is it something that's talked about so much in scripture and needs to be uh, such an important part of our lives? Why do we need to pray? 
once we figure out why we need to do it, how do we do it? Like, what is this thing of prayer? Well, like, people always say, like, close your hand. We teach kids, you know, clench your hands, close your eyes, and really that's just so they'll be focused. But like, how are we really supposed to pray? And then once we figure out how to do it, what do we say once we get into prayer? Like, what are we even supposed to talk about with God? What does that mean? But for that first question, what is prayer? I asked a lot of people, wanted to get their opinions on what prayer is this week, and I asked a couple of our pastors. Uh, by the way, when I ask this question, if you ever want to hear like someone's personality really come out, asking them what is prayer is a great, great question because everyone's personality showed really clearly when I asked this question. First, I asked Pastor Pierce Drake, one of the pastors on staff here. He gave a very elegant, beautiful answer that's very Pierce, if you know him at all and uh, talk with him. I asked him what is prayer. He said this, prayer is how we commune with God. It's how the spirit within us unites with the spirit in the heavenly throne room. I thought that's awesome. That's very Pierce, very beautiful, very elegant. Uh, I then went and asked Pastor Chris McLean, who's on staff, uh, and him and Pierce are uh, two men I look up to greatly, but they, their answers could not have been more different, just in, not an answer, but in approach. I asked Pastor Chris McLean, walk, I barged into his office, and I said, Chris, what is prayer? He goes, dude, prayer's how we talk to God. Boom. And... <laughs> I was like, wow, both of these men are pastors, like which, if that doesn't show you like the scope of pastoral ministry that I've been learning about this summer. Um, I then asked my mom, my mom graduated from seminary uh, with her master of divinity and she gave me a very academic answer. If you know my mom at all, like she's very, that's just how her brain works. I texted her, what is prayer? Uh, and she sent me like three YouTube videos, several articles with like <laughs> quoting authors, a very academic answer, but her answer was this. Prayer is a way to be a part of God's ongoing purposes. Very much my mom's answer, but I've got three younger brothers and I asked my two youngest brothers and my youngest brother, Simon, who's 11, I asked him, he said, uh, I think prayer is like saying stuff to God. I said, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Simon. But my favorite answer that I got was from my 14-year-old brother, Nathan. Uh, I asked him over text. So this is a direct quote from him that I just copied and pasted. So, so good. He's 14, y'all. Like, I preached for the first time when I was 15. I was like, dude, you're only a year younger. Like, get up here. I told him on Thursday. I was like, you've still got time. You can make a message and come up here this weekend. Didn't work out. You've got me instead. But Nathan said this, prayer is time you get to spend with God where you can spill everything out and have it just be between you and God. It's also where you can hear what God wants you to do. Isn't that awesome? He's 14. That's so good. Uh, I kind of conceptualize prayer like this. Uh, the way my brain works with it is I think of prayer a lot like texting. We, uh, I know, awkward pause and you can, um, prayer is a lot like texting is just kind of how I think of it in my mind. Uh, we are not face to face with God anymore. Jesus doesn't walk in the flesh on earth, but we know that he's going to. We know that we're, go we know that we're going to get to be face to face with the Lord again one day. And for now, we have a direct line to the throne room of heaven through the Holy Spirit. We have a way to communicate that we can just pick up our phone. By the way, all analogies, remember, all analogies fall apart at some point. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is just a phone for us to text God with. He's much more than that. But this is how my brain thinks. Sort of like We have this direct line to God through the Holy Spirit. And that's how I think of prayer. So last week, Daniel uh, read a section of Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians chapter six that talks about a lot of what this sermon series, The Good Fight, uh, addresses of we know that our Battles of life are not against flesh and bone. It's not against men and women. It's spiritual f battles that we are fighting. In Ephesians, uh, Daniel quoted a verse that uh, Paul explains that beautifully. And just after that, Paul steps into a p piece of scripture that we call the armor of God. So hear this from Ephesians 6. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And hear this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And for two more verses, Paul continues imploring of the Ephesians to pray, to pray, pray for me, pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, pray, pray, pray. It's really interesting looking at this uh, that 
each of the pieces of the armor of God gets like a couple words, like sword of the spirit. And then that's really all we hear about it. It's like uh, sandals of peace. Like that's really all we get about each of the pieces of the armor of God. And yet right after that, Paul then spends an entire paragraph, three whole verses talking about prayer and the importance and the power of prayer. So earlier this summer, I went up to our Wood Forest campus and got to give a message to our seventh and eighth graders at their Bible study. And I was talking about the armor of God. And I wanted to introduce the honorary seventh piece of the armor of God to them when I was talking about prayer. And this is how I told them that I think is really fun. And I'm going to keep this for the rest of the, however long I'm preaching. But I called, I told them it's like the nuclear bomb of prayer that every soldier has. Like we've got the sword of the spirit. We've got all these pieces of the armor of God. And then we've got this thing that Paul spent even more time than all of the pieces of the armor of God combined talking about prayer. Like it's this nuclear bomb that we can dr just drop on anything in all circumstances, at all times. Maybe you've heard from Thessalonians, uh, the verse that says, pray without ceasing. Like we are supposed to pray into everything at all times with and for all of our concerns. Prayer is one of the most important concepts in the Christian faith. Like it's the thing that lets us talk with the creator of the universe who wants to be in relationship with us. Like that's the whole point of the Christian faith is knowing God, not just believing in him, but having faith in our relationship with him that he holds us and protects us at all time, but that can only happen through trust. And I don't know about you, but trust is usually only built once you get to know someone. Like, can you name one person in your life who you would trust with your entire life? Like you would trust your kids with them, you would trust yourself with them, you can tell them anything, come to them with anything that you only talk to for like five or 10 minutes once a week. Like a lot of y'all, I've gotten to meet a lot of y'all this summer. It's been awesome. And I've had short conversations with you, but like, I love y'all. I don't know if I'd put my life in all y'all's hands. Like I'd, I need to get to know you a little better to be able to do that. And yet that's how we kind of treat God all the time is we think that Sunday morning, like praying together as the church is enough, but it's not in our prayer life. Our prayer life is meant to be so much more than Sunday morning faith. Like that's churching in general is one thing the American church struggles with so much is like, yeah, church is Sunday. And then we go through the next six days and it's like, oh, and then, oh, by Friday, Saturday, like I really need to get back to church. But it's like, we're supposed to be doing it seven days a week, 24 seven prayer without ceasing. We're called to rely and trust on God. Like Nathan's definition said, pour out everything to him. But how can we do that if we do not build the relationship of trust and faith regularly? Like that's how you build your trust in your spouse, right? That's how you build your trust with your best friends is time spent together with them. And then we ask ourselves like, man, it's really hard to trust God. Well, maybe it's because we're not spending the time getting to know him. But here's the real kicker about prayer for me is that, as much as prayer is us communicating to God, it is just as much him talking to us. It is him telling us what his will in our life is. So being in college, uh, turns out Michigan is not very close to Texas. I did not learn that until it got time to drive the whole 18 hours to get up to school. Uh, so I'm not close to home at college. And a classic like college kid conundrum is just not calling home enough. And I'm criminal about it. Like, I'm so bad. I do not call home enough. I don't call my parents enough. Don't call my brothers or my friends back at home enough. And they'll blow up my phone. And like, I'll get to a point where like, I, I feel like I don't want to text them because I'm like, great, they're, they're going to just be like, wow, it's been 12 hours. You know, it's been three weeks, 12 hours, 10 minutes and seven seconds since you last called. And you've been doing all this wrong since... Like, my, that's not how my parents and my friends talk to me when I finally reach out to them after a couple of weeks. It's, how you doing? Like, let me hear about what's been going on in your life. They're excited to talk to me. They wanna hear from me. And yet, sometimes that's how I think of prayer. Like, I'm, I'm afraid to come to the Lord in prayer and talk to him because I think that he's gonna just tell me how long it's been since I last reached out. That he's gonna tell me everything I've been doing wrong. Like, my parents, when I call them, not every, a lot of conversations, but not every conversation with them is about how bad I've been doing on my homework or how I didn't work my hardest on a track workout or something. Like that's not what my conversations with my parents are about, but that's what I somehow think that my conversations with God are gonna be like. Like my sinful, broken parents, like they're the ones who I expect in my mind are gonna treat me better than our good, good father. 
How does that make sense? And it doesn't in my mind, and I've started to realize that. And as much as prayer is about us reaching out to him, like he is reaching out to us. God wants us to talk to him and he wants to talk to us. One thing I certainly struggle with is just a young 20-year-old Gen Z man, young man, I'm not a man, hopefully I'm still growing. I've got my brothers, I won't tell you how many or which ones are not taller than me, the same height. Anyways, hopefully I'm still growing. But as like a young Gen Zer, like I'm super hyper and I, especially as just this extreme in, extrovert, not introvert, extreme extrovert, like I love talking. I love talking to God, but I hate being quiet. If you couldn't tell by the way I'm giving this message, like I don't take very many pauses. I don't like to breathe, I guess. Like I just, it's all go, 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 go. Like my heart rate is pounding right now, not because I'm nervous, but just because I'm like so excited. And that's how I treat my prayer life. Like that's how so many of us treat our prayer life is we're like, God, here's this, here's this. But the thing about prayer, the thing about God is he learns nothing when we talk to him. God already knows everything that's going on in every situation around the world. He's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. He knows all. He's never surprised, caught off guard, and he never learns anything when we talk to him. That's why prayer is so important that like, it's not about God learning from us. It's about us learning from him. We get to seek and find refuge in the Lord in us giving him our concerns and our worries, but it has to be met and it has to be paired with us listening to him. In along that kind of metaphor of praying, prayer being a lot like texting, one thing I realized yesterday morning that God put on my heart that I knew I needed to talk about is Think about how much time we spend doing this, like texting on our real phones, just being on our actual phones. Uh, Sunday morning, I always get that notification on my iPhone of like, You've, your screen time was up 20% this week. It was down 17%. It's never down, but it's, it's always up somehow. Um, and I think, I, you know, you can see the breakdown of how many hours you spent on your phone. And I was looking at that um, and I just realized like, my goodness, how much time did I waste doing this? And what a difference two inches makes instead of doing this. Like what a powerful difference in my life. I wonder like, why can't I trust God more? Why can't I listen to him more? Because I'm doing this so much. I'm doing this texting instead of this texting. And I think that's a serious issue just with the American Western church in general is we get so caught up in just the go, go, go. I don't think it's just a Gen Z young adult problem of like this go, go, go culture of always being all about us. And here's my concerns, God, can you bless me with this? Can you give me this? And then we don't take the time to just sit. Isn't this awkward? But when we still ourselves, like you'll notice when I pray after the message, how I almost always, how I start my prayers is I take a deep breath. And I have to let myself calm down and hear the Lord because that's what prayer, that's the best part of prayer. Like, isn't it so good? The best part of any conversation, right, is always like hearing feedback. When you come to someone that you love, you come to someone that you trust and then they give you that trusted advice. Maybe it stings a little. Maybe it's like, yeah, you're right. Wish you weren't, but you are. But isn't that the best part of like coming to your best friend and asking for their advice is hearing from them and knowing that it's out of love? Hearing from God is the best and most important part of prayer. So for super awkward transition out of that text thing, because I came up with it yesterday, like I didn't have a great transition, how to pray. <laughs> um, any how questions that you ever have, what I always tell people is go to the gospels, seek the gospels. Like Jesus, the incredible thing about him, there's four gospels, they're all about Jesus. The whole Bible's about Jesus, but they're like actually his life story is Jesus did a lot of teaching. He had some incredible wisdom that he shared with the world, but then he always lived it out. He always did it. Every miracle that Jesus did, the feeding of the 5,000, turning water to wine, every incredible teaching, miracle, and healing that he did was always met either beforehand or afterhand with prayer, with alone time with God. He always withdrew to a mountain, to a garden, to a secret room, alone to spend time with the Lord. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6 through 9 about prayer. But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he continues with the Lord's prayer as we know it. So there's this term in Christianese and church language called the secret place that I've heard a lot about and been learning a lot more about this summer. God's been taking me through learning what my secret place is like. But really, if you ever hear the secret place, really all it's talking about and what the secret place is is referring to this passage of scripture from Matthew when Jesus says, go into your secret place and pray regularly and secretively. Your secret place is whatever your rhythms and patterns of regular Dialogue and time alone with Jesus is, and it needs to be alone, intentional, regular time. One thing, especially, and another one of those like little tidbits of like the American church, what we really struggle with is something, especially just, we think that prayer is enough if we just kind of point our hearts towards God, towards God, or if we think that like just thinking about God is prayer, like just, yeah, I, I, I did a quick little thing like, oh God, thank you for this food and then had lunch and I was like, just kind of directing our hearts towards him like a heart posture of prayer. And that's part of praying without ceasing. But if that's all you're doing, Jesus is straight up telling us, no, that is not even close to the bullseye. That's not what we're called to do. What we're called to do is draw away by ourselves and get on our hands and knees and come before the Lord humbly. We have to remember that as much as Jesus wants to be our friend, our brother, our father, as much as he wants that intimate relationship, we have to remember that he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the only one worthy to open the scroll, the only one worthy to go to the cross and take our sins. He's the King, he's the Lord. And we need in our prayer life to reflect our reverence for that. That's why we go to our hands and knees and beg of the Lord to just bless us with his presence. Like the fact that we get to hear from God is incredible, right? Like, yes, he wants to be our friend. He died for us, but like he was worthy of that because he is perfect. The perfect, beautiful, omnipotent, amazing creator of the universe wants to draw near to us and we need to respect him and humble ourselves by having intentional disciplined, regular time to come before him and just get to know him. He knows you. We get to know ourselves. We get to know God more. He doesn't get to know us because he created you the way that you are. He knows us. He knit us in our mother's womb. He walks through everything with us. And along that line of like directing our hearts towards God and thinking that that's enough, we have to remember that our bodily reflection, whatever we do with our bodies in prayer is how our spirit is guided into prayer. One of my favorite books uh, I've ever read by C.S. Lewis is called The Screwtape Letters. If you've ever read it, it's this really weird, trippy, mind trippy book that's written from the perspective of demons. So it's the, every chapter is a letter written by a demon Screwtape to his nephew demon Wormwood giving Wormwood advice on how to tempt a man. It's really weird reading the book. Everything is backwards. When the book says the enemy, it's talking about God. When it says our father, it's talking about the devil. When things are going good in the book, they're really going bad for the man. When things are going bad in the book for the demons, it's going good for the man. And it's, but there's this quote from it where Screwtape addresses Wormwood and, and, and says this. And when I, I've read this book three years ago and it's never left my mind. Hear this quote from the Screwtape Letters. One of their poets, Coleridge, has recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but merely composed his spirit to love and indulged a sense of supplication. That is exactly the sort of prayer we want, we the demons, not us. And since it bears a superficial resemblance to the prayer of silence, as practiced by those who are very far advanced in the enemy's God's service, clever and lazy patients can be taken in by it for quite a long time. At the very least, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers. For they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they are animals and that whatever their bodies do affects their souls. 
We are animals, y'all. We forget sometimes that God created us in and with our bodies to be reflections of him. We bear his image. We're not just created as souls in this temporary body. Like when Jesus comes back, he's going to perfect and renew and heal us to be perfectly in flesh and bone. Like our bodies are not these temporary like robot things that we live in. They're meant to reflect and guide our spirit to the Lord. That's why getting on your hands and knees is so important in prayer. Like some people in their secret place, I know lots of friends who can like sit at their desk and listen to worship music and they can pray that way and like calming themselves that way works. For me, that does not work at all. Like my ADHD brain, if I'm sitting at my desk, like I'm gonna be distracted by my pen. For me, like if I don't get my knees and forehead to the ground with my eyes shut, like I will be so distracted. And doing that for me is how I have found that I know I can focus on revering and humbling myself before the Lord. And in your secret place, you have to find the ways to eliminate distractions and humble yourself before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the other beautiful, beautiful thing about Jesus' teaching and kind of confusing thing about that, that section from Matthew 6 is Jesus says, when you pray, go be alone. Go into your room, shut the door, let no one see you. But then right after that, he says, and this is how you should pray. And the first word is our. The first word is plural. The first word is for the church to say together, our Father, give us give us our daily bread. Like we are not only meant to pray by ourselves. Like I'm not saying that like we shouldn't be praying at church. Like we absolutely need to be praying together. But Praying as the church, praying on Sunday morning, that Sunday morning faith cannot be enough. It cannot be the only thing. We have to have time alone with the Lord. Like as much fun as it is to hang out with my best friend Forrest one-on-one, like I can do that all day. It's even more fun to come together with all of our friends and hang out. But we have time for both. There's time for me to go get lunch with my best friend. And then there's time for us to have fun with all seven of our other best friends together. Like there needs to be that balance of together and alone, together and alone. And together as this body is beautiful, I love y'all, but I wanna get to know the Lord on my own just as much as I wanna lift up our praises and prayers to him together as the body. So let's land the plan like this with my final question. What do we say once we pray? Like once I get into my secret place, what do I even say? And I think that's what Paul was really getting at back in 1 Timothy 2. Because what did Paul say? He said, first of all, before anything, pray for all people. Pray for the kings and the rulers and authority all around the world. Pray for others. What's the amazing thing about being a part of the Woodlands Methodist Church is we have over 14,000 members. 14,000 people in the Woodlands have decided to become members of this church committing to one another. That's what membership really means here. And I don't know about you, but like, I think of it this way. I love praying for myself. Like, pray for your concerns. Lift up what we need in our lives to the Lord. But if we pray for each other first, if the 14,000 members of the Woodlands Methodist Church are lifting one another's prayers up, even if you don't know specifically what it is and you're just lifting up your brothers and sisters around the Woodlands in prayer, before you ever get to your own concerns, you are being prayed for 13,999 times before you ever even worry about yourself. And we don't have to worry about ourselves in our one prayer. And one prayer can change the world. One prayer can change lives. But I think 14,000 can do a lot more. I would so much rather that the 14,000 other people in the woodlands be praying for me if it, than, than it just be myself. Like, I love praying. I love getting to know the Lord. I give him my worries. I'm telling you, give him your worries. But before you do that, like, lift up the people around you. Lift up the people in this room and know that they are doing it for you. And then we don't have to worry about ourselves. So I've got two challenges for us as we, as we step out of this time. I know I've been blabbering exactly like Jesus said not to. So I've got two challenges. They'll apply to people differently. My first challenge is this. If you've got kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, anything, if you've got people in your life, younger brothers, sisters maybe, who are getting ready for the school year, School year's coming up. I know it is. 
commit from today until the school year starts every day to pray for their teachers, for their coaches, for their school administrators, for the people at Woodlands High School, at College Park, at McCullough, that are going to be leading your kids, the ones in authority over your kids. But the thing is, they're not just in authority over your kids. They're in charge of hundreds of others. And if we're a church that's lifting up the teachers, the administrators, the coaches in the Woodlands, how many kids are we praying over? If instead of just praying for your kids, you're praying for other people's as well. Like there's a lot of kids in the Woodlands who don't know the Lord. There's a lot of people, some of the teachers and administrators you're praying for don't know the Lord. And if we're praying for them, the 14,000 of us praying for the 250,000 plus people in the Woodlands, that's powerful. And my second challenge is this. If you don't have someone in your life who you feel like you can commit to praying from now until the school year, like you just, you know, don't have kids, grandkids, anyone like that, I wanna challenge you, pray for those who are in authority over you whether it's your boss, your spouse, your parent, whoever it may be, because the thing is, if they're in authority over you, more than likely they're in authority over others as well. And if we are a church that's praying up and out, God will hear and answer our prayers. Take it from Tarzan. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you so, so much for this time. I thank you so much for this community that has been just so warm and welcoming to me this summer. They have just blessed me immensely and incredibly. And it's all been from your bounty that you've given to them, that they've been so generous to give their time, their wisdom, their offerings, that I might be here learning and growing in such an incredible place. And it starts in the seats. I thank you for this pastoral team that's poured into me and worked so diligently and lovingly to pour into this community. God, right now I ask for your hand of blessing to extend over everyone in the Woodlands Methodist Church, everyone in the Woodlands, everyone in America and around the world. I lift up all my brothers and sisters created with your image, spoken into existence with your breath, I ask that your hand would be over us. Your face would shine upon us. Jesus, I praise you for what you're doing in this place. God, I love you. We love you. We come before you now humbly. Show us the secret place that you are leading us into. We love you so, so much. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for your spirit breathed over us, igniting a fire within us for your grace, for your mercy and love's sake. We love you and we cannot say it enough. Amen.